Okay, when you're ready, you can uh, open your eyes and come back into the Zoom meeting. So perhaps somebody would like to share what they experienced in this meditation. So I think we'll start with the youngest. So I'd like to invite Lisa. She's the youngest in age and I think the youngest in interest. Okay, um, so for me, it was quite um, um interesting experience since I felt in the first beginning very much confusion because um, like some of the concepts I had in mind were today shown up. But in the end of the meditation, I came to the point that there was like a little peace. I could go in peace with the confusion and it was yeah, I'm thankful for this <laughs> because I didn't expect it to happen so quickly. Right, right. I mean, the reality, which unfortunately most human beings are not really in contact with, is that what you experience is what is available to us in every moment of our life. And the only thing that prevents it being like that is that in our mind we have many concepts and ideas and philosophies and experiences and all this package together we call me so this me is what prevents us in being in contact to our true me which it sounds like you had an experience of that but this is always very close we spent maybe 15 minutes with our eyes closed so you're 15 minutes away from yourself in the true self. <laughs> okay, very nice. Perhaps somebody else likes to share. Maybe we have to go to the oldest person here. Well, who, I don't know who that is, of course. I wouldn't dare to suggest. So, anybody else like to volunteer? Okay, so maybe we go for a man. How about Marcel? Would you like to share? Yeah, so... The first few seconds, there were some body sensations where I usually have them when we have the zoom, like here and in the belly, but they pretty quickly disappeared and there was just stillness for most of the 15 minutes. With the some thoughts appearing, but disappearing almost immediately without any. Yeah. Okay. Okay, nice. Okay, so we went, we had a bit longer concert tonight, so maybe we move on a bit. And if anybody else particularly likes to share. <clears throat> so tonight we are moving to this sixth chapter of this book. I think most of you are familiar with this book. Okay, whoops. So this is uh, it's a book we published about five years ago. And actually, this book is quite interesting because actually it has it has inside it quotations from um, the masters who probably I've been most uh, touched by. So I have people like Jesus and Buddha, Lao Tzu from a long time ago. And then we have people from 100 years, 150 years ago, and we have two or three current teachers. Probably the most known one is Deepak Chopra, um, who lives in San Diego in California, or Eckhart Tolle. <clears throat> and here in the book, we have, a, a for each master, we have a, a, a whole page bio which also includes 
um, one of their best books. So there's a lot of information in this in this uh, this book. So tonight we're talking about self inquiry, uh, which of course is what Ramana Maharshi was most famous for. So it was very nice tonight that Om chose this. Uh, mantra from the concert we gave in uh, Ramana Ashram. I think it was it in this year. In this year, so in, back in January of this year, we we had this concert, and uh, so um, chapter six is about self inquiry. And the first thing really is to examine this illusionary me for which self-inquiry is a profound tool. When you really become clear and you realize for yourself there is no separate somebody, that, that we are all actually one consciousness, when this becomes your truth, then surrender just happens. It happens in that moment. So actually, this whole spiritual world, this whole spiritual journey, which can be made quite complicated, is in fact extremely simple. And when you, when you do the inquiry and you come to see that everything you believed since your whole life, when you really see that that's completely false, actually, you have to laugh. You have to laugh in that moment because you suddenly see how ridiculous your life has been and how ridiculous your concepts and ideas and desires and all this stuff. Everything that we hang this me onto, we suddenly see it for what it really is and we have to laugh. And people laugh a lot. Even for hours and hours, they just laugh uncontrollably. <clears throat> and um, if you remember at the beginning of the um, mail that we sent out under, underneath Ramana Mahesh's picture there's a quotation from him and this quotation if you understand the meaning of this quotation this completely blows everything out of the water because what Ramana is saying is that you have to ask yourself, who am I? This investigation will lead in the end to the discovery of something within you which is beyond the mind. Solve that great problem and you will solve all other problems. You will solve all other problems. So this is shockingly amazing, of course. And how can it solve all your other problems? Because, of course, when you come to this moment of realization of the true self, then the one who has all these problems disappears. And therefore, I, I give the, the, the metaphor of a bridge, you know, an arch bridge. If you think of an arch bridge, right, and it's made up of stones, one stone and the next stone, okay? And in the middle of this bridge, there is what they call the keystone. It's in the middle of this arch. So if you want to break this kind of arch bridge, you just have to break the keystone, and then all the other stones fall down. And this seems to me quite a good metaphor for self-inquiry. Because by investigating uh, all these things which we somehow have been uh, given the idea that that's me, that's me, that's me, that's me, that's my issue, that's my problem, that's my concept, that's my idea. All this stuff, endless stuff, you know, endless. When you suddenly come to see that this is all completely false, you see. It's just like blowing up the keystone of the bridge. <clears throat> so what he's saying here 
solve that great problem and you will solve all other problems. You don't really solve all the other problems. They just simply disappear. It's like magic. They just disappear. <clears throat> okay, so I've selected three sub-chapters. This, this chapter actually is full of good stuff. So if you haven't read this book, you might consider reading this chapter. It's a kind of key chapter. And the first one I've selected is from J. Christian Murti. Um, you can see his bio in the book, but he was a contemporary of Osho, a bit, a bit younger. He was a bit younger than Osho. And maybe you know his story, that he was chosen by the Theological Society, um, uh, an Indian, an Indian man, where he was chosen as a young boy of about twelve, I think, uh, along with his brother. The two of them were chosen, and then they were educated, and they were to be the the world teacher. Unfortunately, the younger brother died, leaving only Christian Murti. And when he was, I think, 17, 18, that kind of age, they created a huge meeting in Holland. And at this meeting, he was to be announced as the world teacher. And he made a famous talk, a famous speech, uh, where he got up and said, actually, I don't want to be the world teacher. <laughs> so this was a bit shocking because everybody was coming there to kind of anoint the world teacher. But he said, no, thank you. I don't want to be the world teacher. Actually, in reality, he became the world teacher anyway because he was um, pretty constantly traveling between um, England, India, and um, California. So he had these three places, and he constantly traveled between these three places. And in these three places, he created a school. I think probably those schools still exist. I've been to the one in England many years ago. I was fortunate to meet J. Christian Murti. I think uh, about a week he was giving talks, and I was there each day. Very lovely man, very touching man, very humble but with a great with a great presence, I remember being touched one afternoon because it was uh, the school is uh, in Eng the English school is called Brockwood Park, and it's in a huge kind of country mansion with beautiful grounds, and uh, I just happened to be in the right place, and he and the headmistress of the school and a couple of dogs were going for a walk. And uh, by that time, he was pretty old, and he had such a presence. It was very touching for me. So I haven't forgotten him. And uh, my, my first teacher was Osho, and he used to um, be very, um, very much supportive to J. Christian Murti. Okay, so um, he talks about awareness. So this is exactly what we're doing in this meditation tonight. Awareness is not a commitment to something. Awareness is an observation, both outer and inner, in which direction has stopped. You are aware, but the thing of which you are aware is not encouraged or nourished. Awareness is not concentration on something. And um, when, I, when I talk about Osho sometimes, I often say that the big benefit I got from spending many years with Osho was that he taught me meditation and he also taught, taught me this awareness. Somehow I came to him when I was about 30 and at that time, I had never meditated, and um, I had no real ability to be aware of what was going on inside. I was completely focused always on the outside. 
and uh, inside was not really part of my world at all. And then through my contact to Osho and through um, spending many years meditating, gradually I became more and more able to see inside what was happening. So this is a great um, talent, you know, it's very worth to, to develop this talent of being self-aware. And initially, the awareness is not the truth, you're not becoming aware of the true self, you're becoming aware of something that you believe to be the true self. So this is the first step. And when the day comes for you to absolutely see through the ego and all the stuff, and, and you have a moment where everything becomes peaceful and empty, in this moment, the awareness becomes a kind of surrender. It's as if you then, well, you don't do anything because the you that could do, do something, in fact, disappears in that moment. Disappears in that moment and um, you surrender happens. It's not that you surrender, but surrender happens. So this is uh, the fundamental spiritual uh, task, you could say task. I was going to say work, but we don't want to use really that word, but, that word, but it's like a task. And uh, when you give up this fantasy you call my life, it's just paradise. There's not even anything spiritual about it. Now is the best time. It's actually the only moment. There's no reason to postpone. Next week won't be better, won't be a better time. I've been sitting in this community, Open Sky House, for the last 22 years. And during that time, many, many spiritual people have visited. Many people have chosen to live in the house for some time, some years. Um, <clears throat> and unfortunately, even people who are <clears throat> on a spiritual path are still postponing. They still have some idea that sometime in the future, something wonderful will happen and then everything will be fine you see and as lisa who is our youngest member tonight as she discovered for a moment this is always possible now there is only now all that came before all the memories that came before and any ideas for the future is simply nothing it's simply nothing this is very shocking of course very shocking but also if you see what i'm talking about with this self-inquiry you inquire until you come to realize without any question that it's all nothing. It's all garbage. You see. The only thing is now. <clears throat> Maybe it's because I've become older. This year is going to be my 80th birthday. Maybe because I'm older or maybe because somehow I've spent already 50 years on this subject, I, um, I'm often asked, you know, what is the point of life? What is the point of our life? You see? So if you, if you believe you're somebody, then of course you create some kind of uh, point, you, some kind of object, some kind of intention, some kind of goal, some kind of, I don't know what you call it, you know, and most, unfortunately, in the society, most people have 
created some kind of point, some kind of goal of their life, which they may achieve or they may not achieve. And just recently, it seems to me, because I've always doubted that, I could never really see any point, never really see any point. And, and probably the only point I could really see for the last many years is that the point to come to being completely conscious. And recently it came to me that actually, what is humanity about? What are we all doing? I was sitting in a, it's, it's the public holiday here in Germany. I was sitting in a, a very crowded restaurant at lunchtime and there was probably a hundred people there sitting outside next to the river, sunny, sunny day and looking around at all the other people, very busy in their, in their me's, me, 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 all over the restaurant. It made me really wonder what, what, is, what is the point of this humanity? It seems to me that the only point of humanity is to continue the consciousness. That's the task. The task is to continue the consciousness. And so far, we don't know if there's any other beings in the universe which are continuing this consciousness. So it is only consciousness. And when we sink into this consciousness, then in that moment, if it's, a, if it's true, this moment becomes, your life becomes a paradise. It works on a functional level. We went, when I went into this restaurant today, it was absolutely packed. And just as I came in, somebody left and we could have a table. If I need a car parking spot, somebody leaves just when I need a space and I come in. So everything is taken care of. Life becomes so easy not without problems, not without issues. Sometimes there's sadness, can be anger, can be any kind of feeling, but the, how can I say, the, the underlying uh, flow is, um, is unfolding, unfolding in each moment. <clears throat> And the paradox is that when a deep shift in awareness happens, which we call self-realization, it takes no time at all. There is nothing to do. There's nothing to know. You could wake up now. You just have to see that everything you believe, everything you are, this whole story of my life, is simply a fairy tale that's only playing in one cinema, your own head. Shocking. Completely shocking. <clears throat> so I have then a quotation from uh, Ramana Mahashi. It is the higher power which does everything. And the man is only a tool. If he accepts that position, he is free from troubles. Otherwise, he invites them. By becoming self-aware, you can see what is happening in your mind. It is like you get to know yourself. But the self you're getting to know is not your true self. It is a false self. The false self being the sense of I, or we can call it the ego, the ego self.
So probably many of you are aware that Ramana Maharshi became famous for this who am I? Who am I? And this is the investigation. And if you get to the answer, then everything becomes a paradise. So this, this was what made him famous. It, it wasn't his idea, actually. This is a, a deep, deeply traditional Indian spiritual idea that you have to investigate about I. And when this is clearly seen, then that's it. It's not really complicated. And then I've got a quotation I've chosen from Paul Lowe. I've talked before about Paul Lowe, I think quite recently. He was uh, an English man, or well, he is an English man. He now lives in Australia um, since some years. He lived in Australia. But when, when he's now must be probably late 80s or maybe already in his 90s. And... Um, He's a very interesting character because uh, he, um, he he was one of the early um, kind of new age kind of gurus in London. And later he was attracted to Osho and along with several other English um, therapists, um, he became in one way you could say Osho's uh, closest disciple so he always he lived in osho's house he sat in the front row right in front of osho and when osho got a bit older um he was called tirtha in those days tirtha would give the names when people were coming sannyasins they were given a name by tirtha and he later dropped that name and called himself back his normal name of Paul Lowe. Very beautiful man. All our training has to do with change. You pray for change. You go to groups for change. You become a disciple and follow a guru for change. It's all about change. It's all about being better. It's all about you not being who you are. Listen, you cannot change yourself. It's impossible. Your whole difficulty, why you are not at your maximum potential, why you are not bathing yourself in beauty and glory and light is because you won't be who you are. You want to be different. As you judge yourself not realized now, you think you need to change something so that you can be realized in the future. There is the paradox. Change has to happen, but you can't do the change because the you that wants realization doesn't exist. This you, in fact, is an illusion. You are a creation of your conditioned mind. You're identified with your conditioned mind. And this you simply doesn't exist exist. You believe that it does exist. And therefore, you can also believe you can change so that one day you can be as you are. This then, of course, life becomes very complicated. It's very simple, you see. If you have the courage to really look, then this spiritual work is very, very simple. So it, many spiritual people, they go on for years and years. I, 
I still have sometimes contact with people I met with Osho 40 years ago, and they're still busy with trying to change themselves, you see. Just accept yourself as you are. You're always in the right place. You are always okay as you are. You don't have to change anything. It's not about changing something, but rather it's about uh, understanding who you really are and not being caught up in the illusion of who you are. I myself, when I came to Osho, when I was around 30, in the years between my age of 30 and 40, during those 10 years, he convinced me, Osho convinced me, because I didn't really understand, that uh, I needed to do a lot of meditation. And um, as my awareness increased, I would become enlightened. I was going to become, in the future, I would become enlightened. And many spiritual people become very caught up in this idea that in the future they will become enlightened, you see. And the truth is, everybody, including your grandmother, they're already, we're already enlightened. You see, everybody is enlightened if you want to use that word, which Personally, I wouldn't like to use anymore. I used to, I mean, Osho got me to become, uh, to give up my life that I had before. He, he got me to meditate. And perhaps the best thing was he got me to be aware. I did a lot of self-awareness for years and years, looking inside, trying to understand. But always I was caught up in this kind of nice carrot for enlightenment. I was always moving to this lovely carrot called enlightenment, which would come to me if I was a good boy and did lots of meditation. And uh, <clears throat> when Osho had left and I had gone to another teacher, a disciple of Ramana Mahashi, Papaji, he easily convinced me that I just have to discover clearly without any doubt who I am and this happened for John David this happened one unexpected morning in front of him in a meeting and after that day it never changed it's never changed in now well it happened in 92 or 3 so that's about 30 years I think 30 years ago. Okay, so I hope I've provoked some kind of response. I'll be happy to have a dialogue with somebody. Anybody like to dialogue or anybody maybe has a question? Hello. Can you wave your hand? I don't I don't see you. Ah, oh, okay, okay. Kamal here. Hello. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Ah, okay, good. Fine, <laughs> yes, fine, fine. okay, okay, good. good. So, yeah, very good. So, yes, I, 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 
I heard what you, what you said. And um, for me, it's always a bit of a struggle and also a frustration um, because I, I, I always understand very well what, what you talk about. Uh, but the issue is always that it is a, on an intellectual level. So I, I understand all that. Uh, but what I find difficult is, of course, to, to, to move from this intellectual level of understanding to the actual realization. Um, and, uh, and of course, I think this is the, the, <laughs> the big, the big uh, difficulty of this work, let's say, if you could want to call it this way, that uh, uh, it's, it's not enough, it's not sufficient to have un intellectually understood these concepts. Um, you need to go one step further, which is probably might be easy, but but uh, <laughs> or might be simple, but it's not easy really. So um, even about when you were talking about uh, you know getting rid of all the concepts, uh, even that uh, I, I was reflecting about, about that in the past. Uh, you know, I, I have a, a, a long <laughs> past of being on the spiritual path and uh, trying several uh, paths, so to say, and uh, uh, I have accumulated also many concepts and there was a moment where I said okay enough of that I want to get rid of all of that but still you know uh, it's a thought <laughs> and then in practice is, is, is very difficult to 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 get rid of this concept so of course there are some some techniques help for example self-inquiry um, I try to do it sometimes I am not very regular I must say <laughs> but uh, I, I keep I keep trying, of course. So that's the so for, for me this is the challenge, and and so yeah, and also the frustration. <laughs> but I think you know um, I don't know how long now we meet we meet each other, but uh, probably five years ago we met. Yeah, yeah, five years ago. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. I mean, you you often make this kind of speech that you've just made. <laughs> and um, I think you always make this speech in a kind of very humble way, as if, you know, you're kind of one of the fallen ones who only got it intellectually. But, you know, I've known you now for five years. And yeah. in this five years, I don't feel that you've ever lost this kind of inner longing mm -hmm. that you have, clearly. And while you're believing that, you know, it's not yet happened and it's maybe not going to happen and then it's quite difficult and all these mm -hmm. kind of things, in fact, it is happening because, mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. I say, for five years, you're one of the people that comes regularly to the, um, the Sangha group, you know, every three months, you're pretty much regular there. And, you know, you, you have a regular job in the society, so that is not making it so easy, I would say. You have quite an important job, quite a pressured job. And you also um, have two children in your life, which yeah. involves you in you know, a lot of uh, fathering. Today is Daddy's Day, I think. So yes. <laughs> you're a rather good daddy. And um, so, you know, you have responsibilities, you have other focuses and Unfortunately, when we live in the society and we have a kind of uh, strong, important job, which takes a lot of attention, it's easy not to remember who we are. It's, uh, it's easy to forget, in a way, who we are. Mm -hmm. And so you, you say you only have an intellectual understanding, but probably uh, sometimes, in fact, you you don't just have an intellectual understanding you you have i'm sure periods when in fact you you are there in the true self and mm -hmm. the false self is not really maybe touching you so much maybe it doesn't last continuously and uh you know that makes you maybe judge yourself that okay it's just an intellectual understanding but the longing, even before you met me five years ago, the longing was already there. You tried different things. I think most spiritual people, they try different things. And then finally, they get touched by, by somebody or some, something like Ramana Maharshi's self-inquiry. And um, 
and then everything gets maybe more focused you could say more more yeah fo focused mm -hmm. so i mean i don't think you need to judge yourself actually mm -hmm. because you're definitely on the way and as they say in india you're, you the, the the tiger has you you know you're in the mouth of the tiger yeah yeah no i i don't get discouraged i mean i as i said uh, i i i keep let's say going so to say if you can say this way but uh, or perhaps i should but say is it true that over say the last five or six years you have sometimes uh, moments or even longer than moments of uh, realization when actually you can feel yourself very surrendered yes i, I guess i guess uh, of course the, the, there is an improvement uh, from, from that respect yes uh, uh, yeah, perhaps I, I tend to be a bit, uh, let's say, critical of myself, or, or, or I, I perhaps I look for signs sometimes of something, <laughs> and then I don't see them, or I well, perhaps see, I, I. It's a little bit like Paul Lowe is telling, you know, that you know you see that I, you know, there needs to be a change, and he's mm -hmm. saying it's not like that. You know, mm -hmm. yeah exactly perhaps it's that the change should be that you completely accept yourself as you are mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and um maybe you haven't quite um quite been able to accept yourself as you are mm -hmm. because there's never going to be some kind of other character who shows up inside the body of uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. kamal you know you, you so, so as we can accept ourselves more and more and more and more, and then suddenly when this moment happens and there's a kind of sudden realization, because this moment of realization happens suddenly. It's, I mean, it may be we climbing up the steps, you know, there are many steps. We climb once by step by step, but the moment we reach the top, there's no more steps. Um, and this is an instantaneous moment when there's great clarity. Mm -hmm. And I spent some time, uh, well, I spent quite a few years with Papaji in his meetings. And this phenomena happened a lot around him. He was a big, powerful, strong energy man with a lot of clarity. And so he provoked many people into this moment of realization. It was a pretty constant happening in his meetings. And um, he had this he had this tendency that the, the next day he would invite the person who happened this happened to, he would invite them to come in the front of the meeting and tell us, you know, please talk about it. And nobody could really do that it's very difficult to talk about. So nobody really could do that, especially not in front of a meeting. And so sitting in the audience week by week, I decided that, um, okay, um, I think I'll give it a try. I'm gonna interview those people and I'm gonna kind of creep up. I'm gonna start with their ordinary life and what happened and what happened and what happened. And I'm gonna kind of creep up on this realization and out of that, I hoped that I could shine some kind of understanding. So I'm, I've made a book. You probably read this book, uh, Papaji Amazing Grace. And it has, I think, about 15 interviews I did with people who came to Papaji, where they describe their regular life. They describe their spiritual life. And they describe what happened um, in front of Papaji. And um, I think this book is a bit of a classic book, actually. It was the first book that Open Sky Press published. So it was already, I don't know, 15 or 18 years ago, we published that book. It was the first book. And um, this book is very touching because we, in reading all these different kind of stories of, of the lives of all these different people, um, they they bring you to 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 come to see that actually it's very very simple, and it's not about changing. It's a, it's about accepting. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
I remember one of the most extraordinary stories in that book was uh, an American man who who I met because he stayed in my guest house and um, he had a big blonde beard and he had long blonde hair. He looked like kind of classic Californian hippie type. And when I interviewed him, he was very quiet, actually, very quiet when he was in my house and he was very quiet in the meeting. And uh, when I when I talked to him, he told me how he'd been in the American Navy and he had caught the attention of some important guy in the American Navy. So he was often promoted. And at one time he had the job to be the officer in charge of a nuclear powered aircraft carrier. And in the Navy, if you have something like an aircraft carrier, you have maybe, I don't know, 10 or 20 other ships around, which are kind of protecting the aircraft carrier. So he was in charge of, he was the most important guy out of all those maybe 20 ships. And um, I was completely shocked, you see, because I couldn't imagine how this Californian hippie could manage that. And he had a technique, very clever technique, actually. He told me that his technique was he just trusted everybody, you see. Everybody being trained for a certain role, and he didn't really question them, and he completely trusted everybody. And so that meant that his own situation was very simple, really. And anyway, he he, he was offered to be the officer in charge of the whole um, Western Californian side of America. He was going to be uh, elevated to be the boss of the whole Navy in that area. And he quit. And before he quit, he was living in... Um, naval housing or something and in his in the house he had a sort of shrine and he used to um, dress up in uh, uh, indian clothes and he would um, do his puja doing his he would do his prayer and um, he was always a bit nervous that he might get detected because it's not quite the behavior of such an officer but anyway in the end he couldn't continue in the navy so he quit and uh, I met him looking like a Californian hippie. I never met him again. I mean, it was just a brief meeting, but very touching meeting. His story is in the book. So there are many people in this book who had extraordinary lives, very different kinds of lives, uh, every kind of life, you could say. And they had this inner longing, and this inner longing brought them finally to go through many spiritual practices, many teachers maybe. And in the end, I met them with Papaji and he had the power somehow, I, I would call it a certain power to catalyze the inner longing of these people. I don't know if that helps. No. Yeah. Oh, okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Somebody else like to dialogue a bit? Oh, I have something more. Uh, Katya, Katya is raising mm -hmm. her hands. What? Who? Katya is there. He would, she would like to dialogue. With Hello. You. Can you wave your hand? Ah, okay. <laughs> Good. You're on the corner there. <laughs> okay. Um, Go ahead. Uh, you can hear me. Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, I would like to know. Um, how do I know that I accept myself instead of my ego? Well, you can be pretty sure that everything is your ego. And then in one moment, it's no longer like that. 
And when that happens, there's no question anymore. You can't really talk about it, maybe, probably not, but you know it. And um, I often talk about glimpses that it may not happen, a complete realization. It may be that you have a glimpse. So one day something happens, maybe unexpected, not in a particularly special situation maybe and you get a glimpse where it seems everything dissolves you know everything just simply dissolves it's not that you did something special it's just that it happened like that and and everything dissolves kind of melts away and you have an experience of this enormous uh kind of infinite space and um mm -hmm. it may not last very long because I know in my own case, when this happened for me, um, the, the first few times it happened, uh, there was a lot of fear, a lot of fear. So when this fear comes, that um, immediately closes down the glimpse. But also when you have a glimpse, it's very beautiful because when you have a glimpse, you immediately know something that you didn't know before because before you only knew all this false self in, in the ego, you know, that's, that was what you were familiar with and, and that's what you believed yourself to be. And actually it's relatively common that people suddenly get a glimpse of something else. I've met many people who come to meetings and say they had something happen. And this often brings up fear that maybe I'm gone a bit mental or, uh, maybe I'm a bit, if I tell my friends, they'll put me in a mental hospital or something. So, so this is such an extremely different knowing of who you are that um, many people don't talk about it even. I have people mm -hmm. that come to me in meetings and <clears throat> it happened 10 years ago, but they've never talked about it. Is that the, your case too? Have you had some glimpses? Um perhaps sometimes but it's difficult to describe <laughs> yeah it's, very, it's, it's just impossible to describe really. it. yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. See, it's very, very easy to say you know i'm a woman mm -hmm. i i i believe this and i believe that and all these things is very easy but when when this moment happens and all these things kind of dissolve you see all the all the conditionings we've had for our whole life when this all dissolves, this whole package kind of disappears. It's a bit scary, actually. It can be scary. Mm -hmm. And then you're left in this amazing emptiness, a huge space. And at the same time, although there may be some feeling of scariness, you feel wonderful. You don't want it to stop. It's so incredibly wonderful. You can stay forever there. And maybe you can't stay forever there because unfortunately you're not completely prepared and you know the glimpse fades away and the everyday life comes back. Um, like our friend I was just talking to, uh, he has a pretty um, regular, he has a, a regular job, quite, quite a stressful job and he has two very lively kids which he looks after. And um, I think it's probably very easy for him that he has something happen and then his busy life brings his attention back and then it's very easy to get back the whole package. So, but, but, but still something is different because you've had this other, other moment, even if it's only some seconds, some minutes, sometimes it goes on for hours or even days, but this glimpse means that you know something that you didn't know before even if you can talk about it or you can't talk about it, but you, kn you know inside something that you, you didn't know before, and this is going to touch you very deeply. And so, you know, it's, it's possible then to uh, want to make it a priority. You, you can then make it a priority, and you see that other things which seem to be important before are less important. Mm -hmm. Um, one of my old spiritual friends, he used to say that you were ready for self-realization when you got to the point of your life 
that you didn't want anything from life anymore. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you, you see mm -hmm. what, you know, we, usually we're in some kind of desire, you know, we have many, many desires. So it's possible that you come to the point where you have no more desires. There's, it all goes really, you know, and then you're ready for self-realization. So this is kind of a demanding statement, but I think it's true. It has mm -hmm. to become the the most important priority in your life. So if you think this is going to help and that's going to help and that makes you feel better and this makes you feel good, okay, it's all okay. But they have to. That all has to go, and the priority has to be, um, if you like, the last priority, the last uh, longing. Mm -hmm. Thank did you. We, did, did we meet before? Did we meet recently? Um, not directly, just uh, um, at uh, satsang, but a few weeks ago. <laughs> well, in one of these meetings? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. I was there for the first time and, how, and now for the second. And meanwhile, I was... Uh, in um open sky house for a meditation mm -hmm. oh, okay but i didn't meet you when you were here no i i don't think so okay. Mm. okay but maybe for example when you were in the house you were here for two or three two two and a half days maybe three days mm -hmm. yeah, so no. did you feel something in this house was there any felt, kind of energy yeah. field that you became aware of um it just felt good. <laughs> okay, felt good yeah. well, yes. So, it I mean, was, yeah. you know, in, I spent, um, well, I spent some longer time with Papaji, but I'd already spent many years with Osho. So this thing I was mentioning before happened actually quite quickly, about three weeks of being with Papaji. But then I stayed many, many more years. And... Um, in a way, I couldn't leave because it was just everything was very nice and uh, extraordinarily nice. Mm -hmm. And um, what did I want to say? Uh, I mean, some, somehow, you know, this open sky house has existed now for 22 years and many, many people have come here and it acts as a kind of oasis, you know, if, if you're in the desert and you, you come to the oasis, then you find water, you can drink, you know. So in a way, Open Sky House is a place where you can drink. And we have all kinds of programs here, you know, you're completely welcome. Mm -hmm. uh, you can even live here, you know, you can visit when you like, you know, you can make it a place, you know, where you get a benefit. And so this would be one priority which can support you. So this Italian man I was just talking to, he's been coming here re pretty regularly for five years, uh, coming every three months to a weekend I offer. I have a kind of fixed group that meets with me every three months. And the people who come to that, they have um, similar priority. So there's a benefit, you know, in coming into a group like that. And also I offer retreats. In fact, in mm -hmm. um, next week, at the end of next week, we have a 10-day retreat in Spain as our house in Spain. So, so that's what I mean by priority, you know, that um, there's many other things that people can be doing. You know, there are so many other things. And so this statement from this old friend of mine that um, when you come to the, the end of all this desiring, you know, all these other things, when it becomes, when you had enough of that, you don't want any more things from the world, particularly you don't want relationship, for example, you don't want somebody to make you happy, to love you and so on and so on. Then, then you're, you're ripe, you're like a, a ripe fruit hanging on the tree, which is ready to fall, you know? But but the, 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 the fruit doesn't say, okay, now I'm going to fall, you know, now I'm going to surrender and I'm going to fall down. It's not like that. The wind blows and the fruit falls down because the fruit is ripe. Something like that. 
I don't really know you, so I, I can't judge whether mm-hmm. you're ripe fruit or not. But... <laughs> I'm learning. <laughs> right, right, right. So to get my point mm-hmm. about priority, you know, you, you probably live a, a busy life, and there mm-hmm. are many things how we can fill up our busy life, you know. <laughs> so I think uh, um, your house already influenced my life. Is already what? It had already influence on my life. Right. Well, you came from uh, one uh, staying in your house. Now you've come to this mm. meeting. Now we had this talk. You'll find later probably some something happens from our talk, and then mm. maybe we'll see you again. Yeah. Hmm. Hope so. <laughs> That's a beautiful hand. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Okay, good. Good. Okay, we have time for another dialogue if anybody likes to. Okay. We have our youngest, uh, hottest student, Lisa. Yeah. Um, one point that um, I came across during my previous way was um, the principle of um, cause and the result. Yeah. And um, I today experienced or uh, um, read that by giving up the identification with the I, um, also the um, yeah, this principle is like, um, it comes to a standstill in a way. Is it the way it works? Did I understand it correctly? Well, I think the way way this thing works is actually what's happening with you at the moment. And I shared this with you the other day, I think, because Lisa, I don't know so much about her life, but anyway, she's just in the middle of studying to be a doctor or she's just finished studying, I'm not sure. And so she came to one of our weekends um, was it Vipassana you came to? Together with Katya. <laughs> huh? Yes, it was Vipassana. Right. So she came to Vipassana weekend, which is a meditation weekend where there's about 12 people sitting in a room together so that the energy of all these 12 people supports looking, being aware. And you sit for two days with um, with a blindfold. We bring food. We, we look after you with the toilet and so on we give you an ex- some exercise and out of that weekend you then spontaneously decided to spend the next week in our volunteer week i don't know if you already planned that but anyway i yeah. think you just decided spontaneously that you can't really leave because you got touched in those two days then you stay for the volunteer week and then again you got touched and you decided to join this group which meets every three months is that right yep and at the same time you've decided to come now to spain next week to do this 10-day retreat so basically once you had got touched that's it you know it's kind of that's it because uh, you're already in a process now which you can't easily give up actually i mean you 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 how can I say it's all your choice yeah nobody's going to do anything to you it's all your choice but once you're touched then it's very easy to stay with that being touched and things that seem to be important you know two weeks ago one month ago suddenly don't seem to be so important anymore so there's there's a kind of strange process which is not that you're deciding to change nothing wrong with you as you are you know it's perfectly fine to be a doctor uh the world needs good doctors you know so there's nothing nothing to be changed but when you get touched 
what happens is that you want to then understand what is it that's being touched you know what why do i feel like this you see this is a kind of glimpse you know i i don't know if you actually had a glimpse in the last period but it's as if you have a glimpse you know and so as you have something like a glimpse or you have several feel good moments then that makes you even more determined to understand it so it kind of goes by itself you can't easily just give up on it unfortunately many people do give up on it because they allow the kind of toy shop out in the world where you constantly have many possibilities uh they allow the toy shop to take over again but if you stay with this inner priority it goes by itself you see you're going to come now for this 10-day retreat and at the end of it you may say oh sob this i don't be interested anymore in this and no self-respecting doctor would believe anything john david said you know or you might leave the thing so touched being aware of how vibrant you feel yourself to be and you look around at the other people see how vibrant they are and um you may make some kind of decision you see but it just happens it just happens you see so, life um, just happens you know life just happens now now right now so i have no chance to actively end war or um, further crises in the society right sorry say it again what what <laughs> um it's um so um understanding what you said i don't see that i'm actively kind of ending wars or um, violence ending wars yes what do you mean <laughs> inside yourself you mean the war or no no mean... in, in the society well i mean not since yesterday or tomorrow <laughs> are you gonna kind of make peace in the world unfortunately but i mean it seems to me if you have some interest in the world being more peaceful then the first step is to become more peaceful yourself you know and so what you started to get involved in is a, is a process of knowing yourself really knowing yourself and then you come to peace and you know for example this happened to me um i don't know 30 years ago so I, I never forgot my first teacher. He was asked, you know, um, how can I give back or something like, how can I give back, you see? So basically since 30 years, I'm giving back because I was so touched 30 years ago and I didn't see any point really in going back to my old life. And so a new life opened up where for now for 30 years, I'm sharing my understanding and some people have met me and been touched other people have come to live with me we've had a community you know for 22 years we've had probably we don't i don't know exactly but say 150 people have lived with me in the last 22 years in a country which isn't really my own country but i don't really um i don't look at life like that you know i don't think of myself as i'm from this country or that country and uh, so I'm sharing with anybody who wants me to share with them, basically, I'm available. And so you could say that from what happened to John David personally, he's now giving this back to other people. It's like you throw a stone in the, in the lake and there are ripples, you know, kind of ripples go out from the stone. So this touches some people. I'm not touching millions of people, but I may be touching a few couple of hundred people or something you know my first master used to say that if 200 people became enlightened on this planet it would change everything that's what he used to say so I don't know how many there are on this planet but uh, anyway so peace is not something that one person can achieve you know it's we have to change humanity basically the whole of humanity has to have a new understanding and this happens you know slowly slowly bit by bit i mean buddha was walking around 2000 years ago and uh, he probably touched many many people in that time 
and he, he sent some of his disciples to Japan, for, not to Japan, no, to um, China. One very famous disciple went to China um, and maybe other disciples went to other places, you know. And with Jesus, Jesus had only 12 disciples. And these 12 disciples, after Jesus passed away, uh, they then also then went out and and touched other people, you know. So these ripples affect humanity. But you personally, Lisa's not personally next Monday going to kind of bring peace on the world. <laughs> not doesn't really work like that. Why do you have to bring peace on the world? You just have to bring peace on, on Lisa. You know? I can tell you, for example, something a bit shocking. I would say that since 30 years, not one week has ever gone by without me kind of having contact with somebody. When I, when I was on my way from living in Australia to living back in Europe some 20 odd years ago, I stayed in India for one year in a kind of retreat. And I rented an apartment in a beautiful garden and there was a gate. So you couldn't really come in, you know, it was very secluded. I never saw anybody. And then one day I looked down in the garden and there was this guy sort of walk, walking around in the garden, you know? So I called him, you know, what, what, what are you doing? Uh, you know, and I invited him for a cup of tea and we started talking. And I was amazed, you know, because it turned out that this guy was one of the very first um, Americans, I think he was from New York, who was um, campaigning against the Catholic Church for all the sexual um, abuse that had happened. So it had happened to him, and he was very actively involved in that issue. I only met him for two hours, and we had a talk, you know. But... I mean, I think that was a good example of the fact that when you have become really peaceful inside yourself, people show up, you know, they show up. And I can say for 30 years, pretty much every week somebody has showed up. See. So if you want to bring peace to the world, then it'll all happen by itself, you know, not because Lisa wants to bring peace to the world. Yeah. Okay. Yes, thank you. <laughs> you're a very good guy. Very well, I was gonna say you're a very good guy. You're a very good girl. Yeah. So I hope you continue. I, mean, I look forward to seeing you next week. Yeah. And I mean you you know this yourself. I mean, it's obvious to me that something has happened, something has really touched you, and this thing that's touched you is now if you like, got you. So it's like you're in the jaws of the tiger at the moment, you see. It's very exciting. It's very exciting, you see. It's all in your hands what's going to happen, but maybe existence has got some ideas, you know. Okay, so um, we're a bit in overtime now, but it's okay. It's nice to have this long concert in the beginning. So anybody else like to share something or ask something? Otherwise, we can uh, stop. Okay, good. So I think next week, yeah, next week there'll be the, the final meeting from this book, chapter seven. And uh, then we'll I have the, then the retreat. The retreat starts the day after. We just recently got two cancellations. So if there's anybody being spontaneous, we have space for two more people. Many of you on the screen are actually going to come to the retreat. In fact, most of you are coming, I think. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, she's coming. Don't worry. I, I'm afraid I don't know your name very well. Was it? Oh, yeah, yeah. Leaf, yeah. We're meeting on Saturday, yeah? <clears throat> okay.
Anyway, thank you.